Hi there, my name's Sadie Watson and I am currently a fellowship um, holder based at MOLA in London. I've worked at MOLA for a long time though, my entire career, apart from the last couple of years, has been spent in the field, digging in the City of London. Um, and th this is the reason why I thought this was such a fab session proposal really. We have constantly sought these uh, evidence of the various fires that London has been subjected to over the last 2000 years of its history. And I wanted to think about more um, about how our processes and how procedures might, might be impacting on how we actually record and excavate these fires. So um, London's fires as real and imagined events. Now, there have been many fires in London's history, um, right from the early second century to a few years ago. I'm not going to reference the Grenville Tower fire again, but just to say that it probably is one of the largest, if not the largest, loss of life in any London fire in London's history. And certainly one of the most distressing for us all to contemplate, of course. And it reminds us of the human cost of events. At the end of the day, um, everyone in these many historical fires were principally concerned with the safety of their children and saving precious and important objects. Um, and also the fact that these fires often usually take place within a centrally controlled political landscape of an urgent need to recover and rebuild afterwards and not necessarily to remember. But with all that in mind, uh, the fire that we're going to look at today is the, the Boudicam fire. And the Boudicam fire happened in AD 60. We've managed to narrow the dates down via um, recently excavated evidence, which I'll discuss in a little bit. It occurred within roughly the first decade of Roman London. The official foundation date is 47 stroke 48, although there probably was evidence before that. We don't have the, the precise dating for the very beginning of, of Londinium, of course. And you'll know, um, it's not news to anybody, that the Boudicam fire happened as part of the Iceni rebellion led by Boudicca, and she um, marched from Colchester initially, where, the, where she, um, her fires were a surprise to the local population, to London, um, where the population had a little bit more warning, and then further on to St Albans at the end, before she eventually was beaten by the Roman forces outside uh, London on Watling Street. And at the time of the Boudicam Rebellion, it's thought that the population of London was between eight and 10,000 people. Now, all these fires loom large in cultural history, both for archaeologists, historians and the general public, of course. And Boudicca has become somewhat a cause celebre for, for feminism and for class warriors. Uh, all these, these kind of images of her that we have in our mind, and I'm just thinking about it from the perspective of people that were subjects of the fires. Now, it's worth just saying this is a, a, a lovely reconstruction um, drawing from the 70s, I think early 80s of, of Roman London looking towards the east. So we're looking towards London Bridgehead. We're looking from the west end, really, um, bird's eye view, of course. And pre-fire, pre, pre Boudicca and Fire London was a clay and timber city. There are no real local sources of building stone for London. So the early city and actually much of the later city as well was built with um, timber uprights and clay, brick earth, infill walls for the buildings. And the ribbon development you can see stretches out from, um, from the centre of Eastern Hill here where the proto, the earliest forum was. And that's where the most kind of Romanized, in inverted commas, culture and population seems to have lived. Lacey Wallace's PhD, later published in this book, um, is a really fabulous exposition of pre boudican settlement of London. And she proposes that it was a complex and dynamic period of growth. And certainly she's identified particular aspects of culture and um, populations that lived in different parts of the, of the town. So this is a really fascinating sequence for us to be thinking about. Um, and because the early town was of clay and timber, of course, it went up really well in a fire. So um, Boudicca, when her forces um, set fire to these timber buildings, they went up very quickly and it burnt very easily. Widespread destruction um, has been reported and recorded archaeologically as well, although probably not now, we know, to the level of Alan Sorrell's retelling in which London was um, ringed by the crucified victims of Boudicca's vengeance up to 80,000 victims and we don't think there's much if any evidence for that now. But it is a very clear sequence of archaeological layers um, which we we can identify really easily when we get to it or we think we can which is the crucial point I suppose. So um, at the bottom of the sequence in this section you can see uh, there's, a, there's a road and some buildings and then they have burnt. So there's a very thick layer of um, blackened material forming charcoal and ash. This is the in-situ timbers of buildings that collapsed and burnt. And above them, 
often you have a, a raked over, slightly redeposited, but largely in situ, um, red layer of, of ceramic building material tiles, redeposited material from buildings, the daub from the walls, um, the destroyed fixtures and fittings of the furniture. Um, and this is the layer that was leveled off and built upon subsequently. Sometimes, not in this photograph, but sometimes underneath the black ash layer, you can see where the heat of the fire has scorched the brick earth below. So if it's in a building, for example, and they have brick earth floors in the early city, you'll see a really um, bright orangey red compacted layer of brick earth where they, they've actually scorched in situ. And often this extends across whole sites. So one of the early um, one of the early DUI excavations in the city GPO 75 top right hand corner. This is a land use diagram, a sequence, a way of um, simplifying our sequences that we use quite often to um, to help us analyse complicated urban sequences. And you'll see that the fire destruction was lying across uh, at least four buildings on this site, and this is fairly common that you'll find this. So this slide shows uh, a plan view of the Budokan fire horizon. This is the charred timbers from a building along King Street, which is just to the north um, west of the poultry site, which we just saw in the section. Uh, this is sort of center west of the city. And the, this is exactly where lots of buildings were burning along the ribbon developments along the roads. But significantly, I suppose here um, in the burnt deposits, in London, we don't see the same number and significant uh, degree of burnt and destroyed, so um, charred, melted by fire artefacts as you see in Colchester. Um, so we can surmise from that that the Colchester inhabitants had far less time to prepare to rescue their artefacts, their belongings and leave their houses before they were burnt. In London, there seems to be much more time for, for clearing, taking your possessions with you and, and your families, of course. Um, also in, in the layer above, I, I mentioned about the raked over layer above earlier in the previous slide, there's not the same degree of artifacts in that either. So that might also suggest that people were coming along afterwards and perhaps looting or, or clearing up as they were raking over, as they were preparing for the rebuilding, they were removing the things that they wanted to keep or rescue for themselves. And we can, um, we see that happening in, in modern disasters today. And the other thing that's significant is that road one, which is this road here under Modern Poultry in Cheapside, the main road east-west leading from the bridgehead, which goes over the Walbrook here, um, didn't have a thick layer of debris or fire-related deposits over it. It hadn't silted up much, there was no vegetation growing, so it presumably was cleared off fairly quickly, as were some of the main alleyways off these roads. Um, showing continued use pretty soon after the fire had happened. So, and we know because of, uh, of other examples, that vegetation takes over pretty rapidly um, after a fire event or after um, desolation, desertion of, of areas of towns. And there would have been evidence of this had, had the roads been left for significant amounts of time. So where did the people go? Where were they while the fire was raging? And perhaps it's useful here to think about other fires that we know happened in London. The, the Great Fire of London in, in 1666 obviously happened with, with far more, uh, far less warning rather for the inhabitants. So they were, they were presumably far more panicked than the Budokan inhabitants were of London at the time. But they, um, this picture shows um, people huddling on the foreshore trying to escape the flames. And perhaps uh, the foreshore and the Walbrook Valley and other wetter areas acted as the same kind of um, areas to escape the flames within. And there's a, there's there's a there's a there's a similar small number of dead as well, people who passed away during the Budokan fire, as seen in the 1666 fire. Perhaps only single figures in 1666, we're told now. Um, we think that the, the small numbers in the Budokan fire are actually heavily disputed, but we don't have huge amounts of human remains dating to this exact period. Um, the, the cemeteries that, that we know are in existence at the time don't see huge numbers rising in the immediate aftermath of 60 AD. And the continuity in the road layouts, as I've said, and the building plots in the rebuilt areas suggest that the population did have time to escape before the, before the fire and rebuild the town in the same manner that they remembered it being. So the same people came back, basically. 
There's other evidence from the Great Fire that's useful for us when we think about how people might have survived a few days or weeks or months even without their buildings being being habitable. Um, John Evelyn talks about the, the many people who he, he spotted after the Great Fire of 1666 living in the temporary camps that were built and which stayed in use throughout that winter, a very cold winter of 1666 apparently. The City of London authorities in this case rented out plots of lands on fields nearby and other open areas that they owned themselves so that people could build temporary homes. And there were what we would call today shanty towns, I guess, growing up in places like Moorfields where you could rent a plot for seven pounds. Uh, the degree of central organisation um, that we knew was operational in, in AD 60 suggests that similar arrangements were probably provided, but of course we don't know where. And again, modern fires or modern conflagrations that London has been subject to include the Blitz, of course, in 1940. And these photo, this photo is from 1950, showing how how long the area stayed open for, but also how, how rapidly they became overgrown with vegetation. Rose McCauley's book, The World is My, My Wilderness, is a really incredible evocation of, of post-Blitz um, London and children playing in the in the bomb sites covered in, in vegetation and you can see how very quickly they would have the, the Roman town would have become overgrown as well but it didn't happen so we can surmise from that as I say that that there was um, more control and clearance really rapidly after the fire and we do have evidence that the rebuilding was organized centrally and we have um, recently excavated a series of writing tablets from the Bloomberg excavations in the middle of the city on the Warbrook stream. And this one particularly relates to um, the bringing of provisions from St Albans to London in, in um, October AD 62. And it's worth thinking that both these cities obviously were therefore undergoing reconstruction, but nevertheless, people might still have been living in the temporary um, in the temporary camps and temporary structures because organising their supplies of timber would have been quite a long-winded process, despite the fact that they had central organisation to, to help them with this. And we also know from, from recent archaeological excavations in the city that the rebuilding was um, also expensive and centrally organised. So there's a huge fort constructed on the Eastern Hill over directly over Booty Confired Debris. Um, and this fort was uh, was not in operation for very long, 20 years maybe at the most, and, and lots of the structures within it were, were temporary structures, tents housing the, the soldiers that lived there. But nevertheless, this is a big operation um, that designed to sort of repossess in a way that the cityscape that Boudicca had had destroyed. And there was also huge um, investment in the timbers of the waterfront of the port of Roman London as well at this point. So, and we have dendro dendrochronology from those structures dating to 63, 64 AD. So we know within a couple of years, as I say, this was all um, really quickly being reconstructed. But it is worth thinking about sites where we don't find any evidence of Boudicca. And these are actually fairly more common than you might think. Even on some sites now, we have um, buildings that didn't burn and other buildings in the surrounding area and even on the same site did burn. So it seems to be slightly patchy. Um, Richard Hingley in his latest um, book a couple of years ago, Londinium, a, a biography, warns us to be really cautious about assessing archaeological evidence and as associating it too closely with this, um, the narrative of the uprising that we're so familiar with from, well, from, from pop history in some ways, I think. Um, because the dating and the chronology of this sequence is really crucial and it's only a couple of years it will only ever be a couple of years so without dendrochronology particularly we are really um we are struggling to to define it to within a couple of years of the fire either side really and there are still gaps the ceramic sequences for this period are notoriously tricksy now um we have <clears throat> we have internally we we've rejigged a couple of the of the pot sequences to suggest that that some of these, some of the pots that we thought were post 70 are actually probably closer to, to post 60 AD. So there's uh, there's some more work that needs to be done on on whether we can um, bring down that those chronologies and set the sequences even tighter. And on this is Bucklersbury House photo and a plan. It's not published yet, so these are quite basic images. I'm sorry to say, but the, but the pre can evidence on this site, and it's on the bank of the Woolbrook, very low down, so meters below um, where the buildings were that were burning in the Boudicca fire. So we're in a we're in a, a kind of soggy area next to the next to the Woolbrook stream at this point. Um, there was a series of banks and ditches. And within them, um, minimal industrial activity, possibly some recycling of metalwork going on. Huge. Um, military assemblage of fines, 
um, which is yet to be fully defined as to what that might represent, but it's probably coming from elsewhere, not just from this one site, because there's also lots of re redeposition of rubbish in this area, particularly by the banks of the Walbrook, of course. Um, but even here, even though there wasn't a fire, there's still some evidence of the disuse um, and some silting up of the banks and some weathering of other areas, which suggests that it wasn't being maintained and people weren't necessarily hanging out and carrying on the activity in this particular spot. So even where there isn't a fire, there seems to be evidence of disuse. So, so we can be fairly sure that there was indeed a hiatus in, in London at the time, even if it's fairly small, we have evidence for it being widespread. But when we think about how, how to view um, this particular fire in London. Lots of people have have kind of framed it in the in the way of a, a kind of a class war, really, I guess, with with Boudicca leading a rebellion, burning down a commercial centre established by by Roman little r Roman traders. But but th th this town was also, of course, full of Britons trying to earn a living and people from across the the, the wider empire who were coming here to trade and. Um, and establish settlement in this in this position. Um, and there were financial implications for the rebellion as well, of course. Boudicca um, was owed money by the people that she'd done, her husband had done deals with previously to, to him dying. So um, she's not necessarily the kind of uh, class war heroine that she's perhaps, perhaps framed as being. And from the perspective of the people who lived in the town, which is, which is how I've been trying to think about this, um, it was largely back to work quite quickly, obviously, um, back to recovery and rebuilding, as I say, perhaps not much remembering. Um, much of which, much of this of the rebuilding, as we've seen with the fort and the and the port uh, and other areas of the town, had central funding. So either from the army for the for the military aspects uh, or other uh, and the port as well, probably, but also um, lots of other funding coming in from from the merchants who had serious economic interests in, in London becoming rebuilt again. Um, and there's really not much analysis in the literature of, of how the normal Londoners might have felt during all this, actually. It's an interesting lack in Roman Britain studies that I've found, so I, I suppose I should go away and think about this more. Um, the interpretations of the fire and the aftermath of the fire tend to take the fairly standard route through um, intellectualizing Roman London, which is that of a merchant city with a need to rebuild, partly led, contributed to, defended by the Roman army, of course. And this lack of a detailed study, I think, is particularly interesting when, when we do need to think more about um, the sequences, the dating, as I say, and the specific uses of some rebuilt areas. Because uh, there's a little spot down here in the western part of the city heading out towards um, while well, heading out towards what would later become Newgate, but at the moment it's at this date obviously it's it's within the it's within the city boundary, um, which is a, a little sequence of Romano British style roundhouses um, on a site called Gresham Street, part of a semi permanent camp perhaps only occupied for about ten years before they were destroyed again. But they are built on the Boudican horizon. And these are Iron Edge type circular buildings. And they date, as I say, to immediately after after the Boudican Rebellion. Um, and they sit alongside a larger rectangular building, which is a form obviously more associated with the Roman transition. So it looks as though these, these as, as Dominic Perrin highlights in his recent book, uh, marginal transient communities coming in to in order to help rebuild, contribute to the rebuilding of the town. And actually this particular site has beautiful um, glass beads in an Iron Age tradition. So perhaps these are glass workers coming in to do specific tasks, uh, craft work. And, and the interesting thing about this is that this style of building is really not common um, pre AD 60. There's one other example, I think maybe two in the west of the city again, which is another reason why we need to think about the spatial distribution and um, of communities pre and post the fire to see if there's any links. But it looks like maybe the fire, the hiatus after the fire did, event, did mean that the areas of the city opened up for the rapid rebuilding. Um, and in order to do that rapid rebuilding, they had to ask, they had to, um, people had to come to help them, basically. So this is very much economic migrants, uh, people coming in to, 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 to rebuild, exactly as, for example, the Irish labourers did in London after the, after the Second World War, and resulting in whole new communities being, being constructed within, within what was later to become a very, very Roman town. 
And I think that's where my future research will target. Thank you.